because um, it's an important symbol that we have. In the last four weeks, we've talked about the four different candles and the four different aspects of Jesus as a king, that he is the king of hope, he is the king of faith, he is the king of joy, and he is the king of peace. And a lot of these symbols are very important to us, especially at Christmas time. We have important symbols like shepherds and angels, wise men, a manger and a stable. But we all maybe misunderstand the story just a little bit when we put such an importance on the stable. Because the only reason we think that there is a stable was that Jesus was laid in a manger. The story doesn't actually tell us that he was born in a stable. It says that he was laid in a manger, so we assume that he was laid in a manger, so he must be in a stable, and that must be where he was born. In most likely uh, scenario, the, in the Middle Eastern culture, they would have had a house with a room above, which would have been the guest room. And the guest room, we sometimes translate that word to inn. So the Hebrew word for guest room, we translate that to a place to stay as an inn. But the actual word for a, a hotel or a pub or a place that you would live and sleep in, as we would know, is a very different Hebrew word. So it's really not somewhere that a traveller would stay and pay for a room. So what is most likely is that Mary and Joseph went to family in Bethlehem. They might have been distant cousins, but in that culture, even if a distant cousin comes to visit, you welcome them in as if you're, they're the closest relative in the house. Now, what this probably means is they came and there was no room in the guest room because it was already full because other family members were in the guest room. So the only place they had was the open room at the ground level where the rest of the family stayed. And the rest of the family would have been there together. So they would have been welcomed in to the family. It's a beautiful image to see Mary and Joseph alone in a manger and in a stable with a manger in front of them and just animals around and make you see movies where Mary is giving birth all on her own without any help around. Quite likely there was quite a lot of women from the town around to help her with the birth, to help her through that situation because in the Middle East in this era that would have been exactly what would have happened. They would have been welcomed. It would have been shameful to not welcome distant family in from such a distance. And the manger was there because in the ground floor of such a dwelling, they would have kept their most prized animals and kept them safe at night time. A donkey maybe that would uh, grind the grain if that's the kind of farmers they were, perhaps a few sheep, but that's usually more the what the shepherd would do. And there would be somewhere for the animals to eat so they had a manger to lay the child in. So the only reason we actually believe it was a stable was because Jesus was laid in a manger. The Bible only tells us he was laid in a manger. So sometimes when we see those symbols of, of the manger and, the, and the, uh, the yeah, stable and those kinds of things, we can get the wrong idea about what that is about. And sometimes we end up worshipping the symbol rather than what the symbol points to. Because the symbol is just a symbol. A symbol is like a sign pointing in the direction of something else. So the manger is a great symbol. But we don't worship a manger. We worship Jesus so when we see these symbols on a card or in a church, we have to look at what it's pointing to. That's the job of the symbol, is to point us in the right direction. When we see a tree covered in lights and beautiful decorations, its job is to point us in the direction of Jesus and to remind us that he is the light of the world. And it points us to the cross, which is behind the screen here. Um, but we need the screen for the word. Actually, maybe I'll... We've got electronic devices. We can make this work. Here we go. The cross also was a kind of tree. Well, it was made from a tree. It was wood. And it also bore the light of the world as well. And it bore the light of the world and a very important symbol for us. But we don't worship the symbol of the cross. We worship the man, our God, our Messiah, who died on that cross for us. What that cross points to is way more important than the cross itself. For all of us, these symbols point to Jesus, the King. We don't worship a stable, we don't worship a manger or even a cross. We worship a King, the King of peace. And we don't mean peace in the sense of the absence of war, because in that sense we've all experienced, or most of us have experienced peace for many, many, many years. It doesn't just mean the absence of conflict. Peace does not come when the arms race ends. Peace will not come with arms, limitations or treaties. 
Peace does not come when a general glow of goodwill wells up and we feel magnanimous about our neighbours. The angels give us the precondition for peace, that we give glory to God in the highest. That has nothing to do with whether or not we win the arms race. That was from a quote from one of the commentaries that talks about this passage. And another one comes from the direct translation of this word that they use for peace in this passage. And the translation for that word is, the definition is, the tranquil state of a soul assured of its salvation through Christ. And so fearing nothing from God and content. So peace for the Hebrews means a sense of contentment. In fact, the word shalom means fullness, means everything brought to completion. It's not just an absence of conflict or an absence of war. Another person puts it this way, the true biblical shalom refers to an inward sense of completeness or wholeness. Although it can describe an absence of war, a majority of biblical references refer to an inner completeness and tranquility. In Israel today, when you greet someone or say goodbye, you say shalom. You are literally saying, may you be full of well-being or may health and prosperity be upon you. Jesus brings completeness to our lives. We are made whole because of him. He alone can do that. The cross doesn't do that for us. The manger doesn't do that for us. The shepherds don't do that for us. Only Jesus can bring wholeness and completeness to our lives. We can't do it for ourselves. And no one else can make us complete either, regardless of what romantic comedy movies might want to tell you that no one can bring you completeness but Jesus. And there's the three different kinds of shalom that we need to cultivate in our lives. There is a shalom, a completeness with God, that we have a complete life with our Lord and Saviour. There is the shalom, the completeness that we have with one another, that brings completeness and fullness and prosperity to one another. And then there is the shalom within ourselves, where we find completeness, where we find wholeness, where we find that contentedness that comes from shalom through Jesus. Colossians 3.15 says, And the peace that comes from Christ rule in your hearts. For as members of one body, you are called to live in peace and always be thankful. For us today at ICL, today is the fourth advent, but this is also our Christmas service. So this is our service where we celebrate the coming of Jesus. So we are going to do something a little bit extraordinary and we're going to light the centre candle today as well because it is fourth advent, but it is also our Christmas service. And one thing I like to do to symbolise the fact that all these things are aspects of Jesus is to gain light from all of the candles and light the centre one. Because all four of these aspects of Jesus as King brings us to the centre candle, which is the candle of love. Over the last four weeks, we've talked about the kind of king Jesus is, that he is the king of hope, the king of faith, the king of joy, and now the king of peace. These are like the seeds in the parable of the sower we find in Matthew, Mark, and I'll read a passage from Luke to show us. If you don't know the, passage, uh, the parable of the sower, this is a parable that Jesus told. A farmer went out to plant his seed as he scattered across his field, and some seed fell on the footpath where it was stepped on and the birds ate it. Other seed fell among the rocks it began to grow, but the plant soon wilted and died for lack of moisture. Other seed fell among thorns that grew up with it and choked out the tender plants. And still other seed fell on fertile soil. This seed grew and produced a crop that was a hundred times as much as had been planted. When he had said this, he called out, anyone with ears to hear should listen and understand. He plants these seeds, faith, hope, joy, and peace in our hearts. Rocky, dry, weedy, bird-ridden soil. But sometimes it lands on fertile soil and it grows to abundance. The thing about this parable is that we can do something about the soil. We can do something about it. We can pull the weeds out. 
We can remove the stones. We can shoo the birds away. We can cultivate the soil so that the seed lands in good soil. That is the work of a disciple of Jesus. That is what it means to be a follower of Jesus, is to work in our lives, to prepare our hearts, to do what Jesus calls us to do so that these seeds, these seeds fall into our soil and that out of that seeds, hope and love grow. Hope, peace, joy and faith. Those seeds, the fruit that they produce is love. If we truly plant our, put our faith in King Jesus, if we hope in him for our future, if we find our joy in him, if we live with one another in peace, then the fruit of all of that in our lives is love. The shepherds returned to their lives, this passage says. They didn't stop being shepherds and start become roaming preachers. They went back to being shepherds. They went back to their lives and into their everyday lives of work. But they told that story for the rest of their lives, I can guarantee you that. Just as they told everyone there what had happened, I don't think that that would have been a story that they stopped telling around the campfire. I don't think you can see that image of the heavenly hosts telling you you'll find a baby in a manger, which is an unusual place even in the Middle East to lay a baby. So when they went to Bethlehem, that was the sign that they'd found the right baby, that they found Jesus, who was going to be their Messiah. That was the sign that they were told to look out for. And they would have gone and told everyone. They went back to their lives, but they went back changed men. They went back changed people because their hearts had been opened to the new possibilities of a Messiah come to rescue them. Just as we return to our normal lives after Christmas, it's sad, I know, Christmas is almost here and we're going to stuff ourselves full of food and, and all the good things that we do at Christmas time and probably do a bit of exercise as well and spend time with family and doing the things that we do at Christmas time. But soon that will be over. Come Monday, we will be at Christmas Eve and we will have a, a carol singing service here. You're all welcome to come if you're available. Um, but we look forward to doing that and then Christmas Day as well, depending on how you celebrate. And that will be over all too soon. And next week, we'll already be considering the new year. Next Sunday, we'll be here talking about what the new year might hold for us. And so Christmas is over, but that doesn't mean that we can't take with us the message of Christmas into the rest of our lives, just as the shepherds did. That the rest of our lives, we have that hope and faith and peace and joy that brings love into our lives, that makes us into people of love. By this shall all men know that you are my disciples, because you'll have love for one another. Love your neighbour, said Jesus. It can't be questioned enough how often the Bible tells us that we should be people of love. And that should be the natural fruit that comes out of those things in our life. Hopefully we're exchanged by the experience of the king of love, who didn't come on this tree but is symbolised by it, who came and died on that tree so that we might bring light to the world, so that we too can be a part of his family and be joined in as brothers and sisters into that relationship with our Father in heaven. Jesus is the king of hope, the king of faith, the king of joy, and the king of peace. Because if we live these four characteristics, out of that grows love. And it will spill out of our lives and we wouldn't be able to contain it. Love for God, love for ourselves, and love for others. That's what we're called to be people of. And it's always a timely reminder at the end of the year as we celebrate Christmas that that is who we are as followers of Jesus. Now, you already might know that love in your life, and I pray that that's fantastic, and I celebrate that with you. But there might be people around you who don't, and they need to hear that message, and that might be your task. You might not know that love in your life, and you want to hear more about that. Please ask someone. You're welcome to ask me. I'll always be waiting down the front here after the service. That's why I hang around down the front. If somebody wants to pray, or somebody wants to come speak to me, I'll be here to do that with you. But if you don't feel comfortable doing that and you want to speak to someone else, speak with someone and say, I want to know that kind of peace and hope and joy and faith and love that Marcus was talking about. Can you tell me more about it? Ask someone to talk to you about it. There are many, many people here who would love to share that with you and would love to share that experience with you. But don't go through the end of this year still wondering what that might hold for you. Ruth shared about the gratitude that she had for how good God is 
and the mercies that he brings regularly. And that is something that can be a part of our lives. That doesn't mean that life is always easy, and I'm sure Ruth would attest to that as well, that life can be pretty tough sometimes. But we have a God who walks with us side by side. Psalm 23 always reminds me that even though I go through death's dark valley, you are there to walk beside me. It doesn't promise us a life of joy and everlasting happiness forever and ever and ever. That's not realistic. That's fake. But it does promise us that he'll be there with us through those dark times and he'll guide us through them. So please don't put it off any longer if you don't already know that. If you already know that, then I celebrate that with you and go and share it with the people who do need to know it. I pray these things that you will have a Christmas that you can carry with you throughout the year. Not because the twinkle lights are pretty and the mulled wine tastes nice and the biscuits are wonderful at this time of the year. But you take it with you through the year because you remember that all of these fruits come out in us through love for one another. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for the opportunity that you've given us for us to come here to celebrate the birth of your son. And we praise you for that because he came so that we too might become part of your family. That we are now joined into the family of Abraham, that we now too are also part of your special people. And we thank you for that blessing that you've uh, made, given to us. We pray that you help us to open our hearts, to remove the rocks, to pull the weeds, to scare the birds away so that our hearts are fertile and ready to hear what you have to say to us in this season at this time of the year. The consumerism of this time of the year can bring us down. It can put weeds in our path and give us troubles. The money we spend can put us into a financial difficulty that makes our lives even harder at this time of the year. Lord, we pray that we put all of that stuff aside and we pull that out and look for the good fertile soil that love can grow out of. We pray that you bless us in the coming days and weeks as we spend time with friends and family or even alone and remind us of your love for us. We pray these things in your name, Father, Son and Holy Spirit. Amen.